Welcome back to episode 15 of the 755 Followed Me Home Project, a documentary on rebuilding rather than replacing a classic 55 series tractor. In this episode, we transition from engine assembly to attacking the chassis with patience, perseverance, and Prairie Land partners. When this tractor came apart, the focus was on finding out what was wrong with the engine, not so much about putting it back together. A video assessment was made and mental notes were taken of the small things, like wrong and missing bolts, bad paint, and generally do anything that would add value to the tractor. What I didn't expect were the number of surprises that I was going to encounter along the way. Here's an example. Well, as you can see, this little O-ring here has gotten pretty hard and flat. Must be replaced. This radiator was repaired. It had a leak and when it came back, of course I had no reason to be putting water in it. So as I was preparing the tractor, I put some water and yeah, just cut it. It's really, it might even be a different type of material. I thought I'd put some water in it before putting antifreeze in just to see if there were any leaks. And then it started leaking. And uh, I put in an order to John Deere for some more O-rings. I'm going to fumble and fiddle around with it. And see if I can get it on. There we go. With that as a teaser, let's get this thing going again. To any new viewers, and to those of you who have been following this channel, this is the blind date engine. When it followed me home, the fuel shutoff solenoid was missing, a rod had been put in place to manually turn the fuel on and off, and the return spring was missing off the fuel shutoff shaft. Who knows why, but why doesn't matter. The hack repair will be returned to OEM condition. This is a 755 Governor housing. This is the fuel shutoff shaft that has a return spring on it and there's an o-ring seal in here that might leak. It's sort of difficult to see but we're looking at that shaft right there. It has a flat space on it. You can see it when it returns. It moves this assembly to shut off the fuel or to let it flow. The way to get this shaft out is to take out this set screw it's sitting here in the back. It has a needle on it and uh, it's just a um, flat blade small screwdriver. I didn't think it was going to come loose but it did. So that you take that out. So now the fuel shutoff shaft can be rotated and pulled out of the governor housing. Notice there's a shiny plate and then a darker one. When you put the shaft back in, you have to rotate it until it will pass the first shaft and engage the second one. I ended up having to cut the old O-ring off of here. It was kind of flat on one side anyway, so let's see if we can get it, get this one on. They do stretch quite a bit. So to make it easier to put this together, we'll put the pin through there, through here, put the washer on the back, and the cotter key through. Now there are two different levers depending on the type of mount your solenoid has. The book has that information for you. And while we're at it, we just as well put this piece in too. A lot easier to work on out here where you can get at everything. This arm was a kit and the dealer I found this spring from, which was discontinued for my local guy, 
Um, they are a very slow moving item. I don't know why anybody would have one worn out or broken off. Anyway, we'll spread these and move on to the pump. To help with installation, I'm going to put a little bit of assembly lube around the shaft and O-ring. You kind of have to rock and roll this when it goes in because it has to face those pieces inside. You're putting a little pressure on it until it goes in. With the shaft in, it's going to be a bit tedious to bring the spring down and put it over this bolt. So what I'm going to do is bring that shaft out just enough to give me some room to clear the head of that bolt. And it's going to take a little bit of effort to do this. So I'm prob probably just going to shut the camera off for now and then I'll get it done. Well, the trick was to bring the spring down to where you can grab the top of it, the loop, with the needle nose pliers, bring it underneath, and then use a small pick or screwdriver to help slide it over the pin. To finish the procedure, take the set screw, rotate the shaft, so the set screw will go, well here, let me do that. You rotate it so the set screw goes in and using a very small little screwdriver set it in Verify the shaft rotates, comes back to position, and we're good. Well, with the linkage ready, we can attach the fuel shutoff solenoid to the bracket. In case this 755 ends up in the Northwoods, it's getting a block heater. Block heaters provide direct heat to engine coolant to assist starting in cold weather. John Deere Parts has a two-part option that consists of two assemblies. The AM882530 adapter kit for $116 and the heater kit AR87167 for $95. I found a less expensive solution in this 400 watt heater kit for 6 and 755 tractors from Zero Start. This one has the flange and element in one unit for $106. The block has a place for it, so let's put it in. What we want to do is rotate it. So we get a hold of it with our pliers. And since these holes are never used unless you have a block heater in it, these threads can get pretty nasty in there. So I've got a correct size tap. I'll put a little bit of WD-40 in there. And we'll just chase these threads down. If we can get that in there. I've looked in the hole and there's some rust down in there.
This is a eight millimeter coarse thread. And this tap will only go about so deep into there. So uh, what I've done, I picked up some 8 millimeter by 12s to replace the 8 by 16s just so they don't need to go all the way down into the bottom of the hole. It's a little bit difficult to see, but when this flange was punched out, it dips a bit on both sides of where the heating element is inserted. So I'm going to uh, use a little bit of make a gasket on this backhand side. The instructions from Zero Start say to just apply the gasket dry. I don't know if you can see, but this this flange has been deformed a little bit by the stamping. So I'll just apply just a thin coat of this gasket maker. Just on the, I'm just going to put it on the one side. Maybe to fill in those spaces around the stamping. And zero start says to put the plug-in side of the device to, away from the flywheel. They call it the front of the engine, but in really it's the back of the engine. And this is a six millimeter Allen wrench. So we'll just take this down snug to the gasket sealer starts pooching out and we'll let that set for about an hour before we tighten it down. Building and installing a new engine in an original tractor is one thing, but to do it in one that has been neglected or treated like a gas-powered lawnmower is another. Correcting mistakes and shortcuts takes patience, perseverance, and in my case, a helpful parts department at Prairie Land Partners John Deere. That $1.35 O-ring for the radiator drain plug wasn't on hand, but was ordered with the same professionalism as if it was a new 9RX830. It takes patience to research what parts need to be replaced, perseverance to put things back where they belong, and it takes a good dealer network that has correct parts for this 37-year-old tractor. In my lifetime of living and working on a farm, I've driven an 8N Ford, a Jubilee, a 961 diesel, a Case 830, and finally John Deere 3020, 4010, 4020, 4230, and the best tractor I've ever owned, a John Deere 4440. I'd always heard that if you bought John Deere, you were paying for the green paint. Well, like the paint, the rest of the brand is worth it. Look at how many other tractor companies have merged, played with names and colors, and especially in the compact tractor market, come and gone. Personally, I prefer the classic lines of the 55 series tractors over what I see as the basketball shoe design prevalent in all makes today. Coming up in part two, we'll get the fuel tank in, tidy up, and get things ready for the engine start. Stay tuned. Oh yeah, that's feeling good.